Rafa Nadal, did you bang your head on purpose? Listen to this question. And you banged your head on the camera going out. Was that deliberate? Was you psyching yourself up or was it an accident? It was an accident. I don't know what's going on. The camera turned it to the right. It amazes me, the people that get in with media credentials at big tennis tournaments and have access to larger-than-life characters of our great sport tennis like Rafa Nadal and ask questions like this. Roll it again. And you banged your head on the camera going out. Was that deliberate? Was you psyched? Play this back. Did you catch... Did you see what I saw? This is crazy looking. There just happens to be a bald guy. No offense to bald people. Bald people are people too. There is a bald guy with a tan skin like Rafa, right? Perfectly placed behind Rafa. So that if you just see this out of the corner of your eye real quick, it looks like Rafa walks into a camera and it pulls his wig off the top of his head, right? It reminds you, if you're a Sopranos fan, it reminds me when Ralphie Cifaretto's wig fell off and Tony and Christopher scream. <laughs> Thank God Rafa's uh, not bald guy wearing a wig. I mean, of course he wasn't. The man, despite some issues, has beautiful hair. He's a beautiful man. Welcome to Coffee Break Tennis, the most fun place on the planet if you like tennis. If you don't like tennis, it's probably just downright dreadful. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show. Did I say uh again? I noticed in my last podcast I said uh, 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 way too much. Uh, guess what I'm drinking? Uh, not gonna say that. It's not coffee. It's lame. It's sleepy tea. Sleepy tea. Oh, by the way, my uh, personal friend, Mr. Goat, he's here too. Okay, Mr. Goat got his face up in the microphone. Um, welcome to Coffee Break Tennis today on the podcast. Hey, if you hate these podcasts, I'm sorry. We will have a video tomorrow, no matter what. But tonight, we have a brief podcast because the bottom half of the draw is shaping up. And we've got a red alert from Stanislaw, the man is love, Vavrinkis Law. He has sent a shot out across the boat. Just kidding. I know it's across the bow. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the music from today. We had a comment on the last video from Richard Sylvester. He said, what's the name of the music track you started this video with? Because uh, it was pretty uh, it was pretty banging, right? It was pretty good stuff. Uh, where was it? Where was it? Uh, excuse me. Let me look up the song real quick on La Computadora. It is called Rest by a fellow named... Uh, where's his name? I just had his name. I just saw it. Uh, I think it's Otis Mc McDonald. I believe the guy's name is Otis McDonald. Yes, Otis McDonald. That is the name, so answer for your question, Mr. Richard Sylvester. Thank you for listening to the podcast, Mr. Richard Sylvester. Um, Today... We're going to talk about this bottom half of the draw. Also, I'll talk a little bit about what I got right and wrong about the Roger Federer match with Oscar Otta, Otta the Otter, who, uh, credit to him, man, he played uh, he played really well, kind of like something I did say. We may see this guy come out and play like, I might never have a chance ever. And since the match happened, I found out Oscar Otta, 25, doesn't sound super young, right? But it's still 12 years younger than Federer. When he was young, young enough to be a boy still, he looked up to his idol, you guessed it, Roger Federer. So, like I said, maybe Oscar will come out and think, I will never get a chance to play my idol, Roger Federer, ever again on a big court like this in front of all these people. So I'm just going to, as the Bryan brothers would say, let it rip, let it soar, make your tennis dreams come true and more. Something like that. That was their song. So, <laughs> we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the bottom half of the draw. So, let's take a look 
Also, we've got some uh, some guys who have been great on clay this year who are gone. Guido Pella, he's gone. And, of course, the one that inspired me to, to do the main thing about this video, Christian Garin, Ch Chile, a Chilean. Stanislaw the Manislaw threw that dude a bagel and a breadstick in the first set and a 6-4 to make it look respectable. <laughs> wow, that changes everything. Now, if you have a, a good memory, you shall remember that I said, I don't think Stan's going to do well here because he's going through a breakup with Donna Vekic. My understanding is that she broke up with him. I, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but they're not together anymore. And I said that likely this is just, you know, Stan hasn't been doing great and he's got to be bummed. He's got the blues. And uh, yeah, that would hurt him, I thought. But I also said a slight caveat as the intellectuals say, maybe it will harden his heart and help him focus on the task at hand. And then something occurred to me today. I'm thinking, wow, Stan just came out of nowhere and just, again, a shot across the bow. Beat down City. Not the Oscar Otto match. That wasn't quite beat down. I mean, it was comprehensive. It was a respectable loss. 6-4, six, 6-4. Four, six, four, what was it? 6-4, 6 You get the point. A break in each set. But this was beat down City on a guy who's been on fire on clay this year. A guy who uh, I thought would beat Stan, most likely, or at least they would have a crazy match. And Stan destroys the guy. So I started thinking back to, what was it, 2015. Stan doesn't defend his Australian Open title. Remember, he won 2014 over Rafa, who was not 100% fit. Which, another reason why you should respect Rafa, no matter what you think of the guy. Rafa knew he could have just said, hey, I'm not healthy, I gotta stop playing. But he gave the crowd, he gave the crowd what he feels like they deserve. You pay the money to get into a Grand Slam final, you want to see a match. Right? You don't want to see, uh, like, uh, that Amelie Moresmo Australian Open final, whatever year that was. So Rafa knows that, and also, for Stan... It's almost like there'd be an asterisk next to his name, next to his Australian Open win in 2014, if it's by retirement. Uh, if you read up on the history of Stan, his first title that he won was retirement in a final. Not a Grand Slam title, a much smaller tournament. Can't remember what tournament. And he then lost in uh, like five, maybe more. Several finals, he would lose. He was like a choker, right? So much talent and collapses mentally. That was the thing on Stan until 2014. 2015, Stan does not defend. Then he's having uh, some losses, kind of like this year. Losses where you think, ah, well, he's having a bad season. Then suddenly, Stan goes through a divorce. Now... Well, I'll explain in a moment. Stan is going through a divorce, and he wins the French Open. Not only does he win the French Open, but he helps his friend and all of the Fed heads. <laughs> Djokovic would have won all four majors that year. Now, okay, maybe, maybe he didn't help the Fed fans. Maybe Federer wins Wimbledon that year because Djokovic chokes at Wimbledon because he already won the Aussie he already won um he already won uh, the, 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 uh, the the french open obviously because in my hype hype hypothetical situation here i'm drawing up stan doesn't win in the final and then maybe federer wins right i don't want to confuse my years cuz i'm going to get all confused here but no it's 2015 let's be clear 2014 was the wimbledon final where it really felt like federer should have beat djokovic 2015 not quite as close. Still, we always feel like Federer should win any Wimbledon final. Anyways, my point is, I got way off topic. Back to the subject. Stan is going through a divorce and some bad uh, results. And then he wins the French Open. Oh my God. I put it all together. Now Stan going through a breakup with Donna Vekic, who I'm not entirely sure he hasn't been with her since... 
the divorce? Since a little before the divorce? I don't know. I'm not. No rumors spreading here. I did a bit of research because I'm just sitting here as a tennis fan, curious. Because it occurred to me, didn't he go through the divorce last time he won the French Open? And he had a bunch of uh, not-so-good results. So, okay, we can draw a parallel there. Maybe I've dragged this big theory of mine out too long, but I just want to put that out there. And with that said, we'll look at the draw and actually see, is there a path for Stan? And one more thing. I believe Donna Vekic broke it off with Stan. I don't think anyone knows for sure. This was different, though. The divorce sounds more like Stan wanted to uh, to leave. So I go back to April 21st, 2015, an article from www.news.com.au, Australian slash sport. Stan Vavrinka's messy split from wife goes public. Stan announced this week his on-off relationship with his wife is over. The Swiss star announced on Facebook, citing challenges of his professional career as a contributing factor. So basically, the gist of this is he kind of blamed bad results at the time. Remember, he doesn't defend his title to start 2015 at the Australian Open, 2014 defending champ. And he has just a bunch of bad results going to the French Open. And the big kicker here is the wife comes out and says, that's BS. Stan's career is not hurting because of divorce. The divorce is happening because he wanted it. And she basically kind of says that uh, he's been dishonest. Don't know if that just means lies or what all that could entail. Uh, Let's see. His instability and the wish to regain freedom in all areas are the reason for the split up. I admit the repeated lies and the breach of faith destroyed all the trust I had in him. Now, they were together for some time. Nobody knows what their marriage was like. Nobody knows what happened. I can tell you that being married can be extremely uh, difficult. I imagine for everyone who's married, can't say that for sure, but I know it can be very difficult for both parties, and it's easy to say one person is the bad guy or the bad woman or whatever. So I don't want to pass any judgment on Stan and his wife, but just want to put that out there. Maybe that's a little different. Maybe Donna Vekic, the girlfriend, broke up with him here. Maybe there he left the wife, and I I don't know. I don't know. I just want to say maybe it's very different, but I put that out there. So with that said, let's take a look at the draw. So the draw is a filling up quickly on the bottom half. Tomorrow, we will have all the third rounds set on the top half. And before you know it, we'll be in the freaking quarterfinals, and this thing will be over and in the history books. So savor this moment when no one knows what the H is going to happen. Stefanos Tsitsipas will get Krajinovic next up. Uh, That could be tricky, but you know what? This Hugo Delin guy from Bolivia that Stefanos just beat, one of these guys on clay who's been very good, like Christian Garin, like uh, Guido Pella. So that's a big win for Stefanos. And especially, he loses the first set, and then he throws a bagel down. I watched that match today, and I can see how some people don't like Stefanos because of the way he behaves sometimes. Seems like maybe he could be a jerk. But you know what? Two words for you. Roger Federer. I'm sure his behavior upset all kinds of people back then. Now he's the most beloved man in history of sport, pretty much. Oh, by the way, let me get some more of my sleep tea. (laughs) Ugh, sleep tea does not sound as good as coffee slurping. So, I think uh, Stefanos will get through Krajinovic, Stan, and Grigor Dimitrov. Grigor Dimitrov, he needed a draw like he had for this result, and boy, did he need this result. He... Had a brutal match. He had incredible moments, some amazing shots he hit, including a tweener that he was sliding. He overran a ball and had to hit a reverse tweener. He lost the point, but still. Marin Cilic was the only person with a seed that high, 11, basically top 10. Let's just call it top 10. It's 11. It's 11. This one goes up to 11. Uh, That was like the only guy with such a high ranking, minus Sasha Zverev. I could see him beating him. 
But this was perfect. And credit Grigor for coming through. But after what we just saw Stan do to Christian Green, he's got to beat Dimitrov. Maybe he can't sustain it. Maybe it's a one-off. Maybe it's a fluke. But I don't know. Something tells me you're going through a difficult time in your life. I don't care if Stan's idea was the divorce. I don't care if it's the wife's idea. I don't care if he broke up with Donna. I don't care if Donna broke up, broke up with him. They were long-term relationships. You know, he's been with Donna a few years at least. So it's long enough. It's just not a fun time. And we all deal with it differently. But I'm telling you, you're either going to be pretty devastated and it's going to hurt you. Or you're going to just toughen up and be capable of some incredible things if you focus the energy the right way. We could see it. Stefanos Tsitsipas, stand the man. That would be a round of 16 next up. Now, just below that is where Federer is. And Nicholas Mahu, <laughs> who waits for Leonardo Oscar Mayer Wiener and Schwarti D, Diego Schwartzman. They will have to play again tomorrow. That sucks for those guys. Whoever wins, that's two days of playing while everyone else in that section is resting, including uh, Roger Federer and Kasparu the boy. Uh, Wagwan. So, by the way, who thinks Kasper Rude can beat Federer? He's another guy who's been pretty good on clay. He lost to Christian Garin in Houston on the fake red clay that they they basically put food dye on green clay in Houston. <laughs> and then uh, Nicholas Mahu is above that. I'm not putting. I'm not editing anything. Wi Fi is acting crazy. I have no idea how late this video is going to go up with. I don't know why my Wi Fi isn't working. We'll figure it out. Hopefully, might be very late posting. Uh, I, I don't, um, I lost my train of thought. Anyways, oh, my point was, you're not going to see the picture, so visualize it with me. We have four little brackets of matches here. All these people are fighting to get into two round of 16 matches. Tsitsipas, if he beats Krajinovic, if Stan beats Grigor, they get in one match. The winner of that will be in the quarterfinal that is likely to be what we all hope, Federer. Nicholas Mahu waits for Diego Schwartzman and uh, Leonardo Meyer. Meyer leads two sets to one. I believe they're at three all or four all. They'll pick it up tomorrow. Part of me expects Schwarti D to come out, the, the little warrior, and, and get that win. He's a lovable guy. Would love to see him. Plus, Federer's been practicing with him so much. I feel like that always helps Federer when he knows that he might play someone at a crucial moment in tournament and he practices with them a bunch. Don't you love that? And then you got Nicholas Mahu waiting for the winner of that. And what a great story, by the way. Just a quick. I'm sorry I'm losing my train of thought here, but I just want to say, if you didn't see Mahu, Google it or something. Uh, he wins. He's got a good draw. The guy was not even sure if he'd be healthy enough to play. He's actually 37. He's the same age as Federer. I didn't realize. I knew he was in his late 30s, but I didn't realize they are the same age. And his son's there. You've heard Federer talk about it when he was younger. He said he wanted to play long enough for his kids to see him do well at a major. Well, lucky for him, he's been able to win some majors in front of his kids at an age old enough to where they should remember it. Ungrateful brats. Just kidding. They seem like great kids. I, I get to watch them. All four of them, actually. I get to watch them practice in Cincinnati with uh, their coach and Merka sitting there watching them. And uh, I I just I couldn't look away from this practice. I had to see if they had the magic like Federer. But honestly, to me, they just seemed like regular little kids. I think all little kids pretty much start out about the same. I mean, obviously, you know, they could play. They could play a little bit. Anyways, enough of that. We all know that these players want their kids to see them do well. And for Mahu to do so well here and have his son come out on court, what a great story. It was pretty incredible stuff. And... This is, uh, everything's falling into place for Mahu because these guys having to play on the rest day, that sucks, especially, and you know it's very likely to happen. Shvardi D takes that thing to a fifth set, and whoever comes out has had to play a lot on a rest day. So that helps uh, Nicholas Mahu. I still don't expect him to come through, but man, talk about everything's falling into place for him. Everything's falling into place for Federer. He should be able to get through Kasper Rude. It's such an advantage to play these young guys for Federer with all the experience. Federer should be able to get through there, no problem. And then he could maybe face Nicholas Mahu. But then he would be in a quarterfinal. And what we've seen from Stan makes you think he might blow Dimitrov 
and Tsitsipas, or God forbid, Krajinovic, away. And then we're right back where we were. See, it all comes full circle, folks. 2015, Stan, when he wins the French Open after a nasty split with his loved one, right? A divorce, the lowest of lows for most people. And what happened in 2015? That was the last time Roger played at the French Open. Remember, 2016, he didn't go to the French Open. He played on clay, but he did not play at the French Open. He shut it down to get ready for Wimbledon, where he lost to Miloš Raonic in the semifinals. Should have won. Would have beat Murray, because Murray would have been scared of him in the final. Maybe not. Maybe it would just be a horrible loss to Murray in a final of a major. God forbid. That would have been horrible. Thank God that didn't happen. So we go back to 2015. Quarterfinals. Stan beats Federer. Straight sets. Wins the tournament. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? There you go. That's my big theory. What a nightmare. Federer loses in straight sets to stand in the quarterfinal. And one big thing that's different than uh, the 2015. Uh, Stan doesn't have to go immediately from there to face Rafa. In fact, uh, what happened that year? Was that a year where Rafa just didn't even play? He just said, I'm not healthy enough to play? Because I know that year, Stan sets a record by beating number one and number two. Djokovic, number one in the final. And at the time, Federer is number two. And I want to say 2015, that was a year where Rafa was, a lot of people were writing him off. Was that the year where his ball was falling short all the time, sitting up, and people were just stepping in and smacking winners off of the Rafa forehand of all things? Imagine that. Uh, Below that, Nishikori and Laszlo, another guy who's been really good on clay this year, Laszlo Jetta, as they say on Tennis Channel. Laszlo Jerry, Jetta. Uh, I never know what to expect from Nishikori these days. I think he'll get through. And then below that, Benoit Pair, who could have made things so much easier against Air Bear, but he didn't. But hey, love the guy. But you know who Benoit Pair has to play? Someone that we all love even more, who's kind of like Stan, been struggling and all of a sudden playing really well at the French Open? A little guy whose name rhymes with Roblo Moreno Pusta. Any guesses? Pablo Corina Busta! That guy and Benoit Pair. I pick Busta at this point. I don't know who to pick. I love these guys. So, uh, Nishikori, Busta, Pair, Laszlo, whoever comes through there. Then you got Rafa and David Goffin. Kind of a test for Rafa because David Goffin is far from far better than a qualifier. And then you got this Moutet, uh, young French man. Don't know much about him, but I knew Juan Ignacio Londero is a guy who's been really good on clay this year. Of course, I'm sure Rafa will give him a spanking. So it looks like here's the quarterfinal I see coming up there. You think Nishikori Nadal is the quarter on the very bottom? Winner of that plays winner of, would it be Stan Federer? Would it be Tsitsipas Federer? Very hard to predict at this point. Uh, 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 oh, man. I'm going way over time, and we still haven't talked about Federer's match. By the way, Nadal looks incredible. So Nadal's going to beat Londero, Mutet, David Goffin, all those guys, no problem. Nishikori, Jera, Carreno, Busta, Benoit Pair. Who comes through there? I really want it to be Benoit Pair. I want the French crowd to get to see... Rafa feed Benoit Pair a bunch of baguettes and bread and uh, bagels. <laughs> I love Pear. Who would ask for that? Hey, if he gets there, he'd be so happy to lose the Rafa. He'll take it. Those quarterfinal points and that big check. He'd love it. All right. Here's the biggest thing. Federer. If Stan plays amazing. This isn't 2015 Fed. Sitsi Paz comes through. I think Fed can still win. Uh, what did I get wrong and right about the match? And then we'll shut it down and we'll get the heck out of here. Is there anything else I'm forgetting to talk about? You know what? A very special friend and someone who's a part of our Patreon. If you want to be a part of Coffee Break Tennis, click the link down below. Patreon.com forward slash Coffee Break Tennis. Help the fastest growing tennis talk show in the world grow even faster. Free me up so I can put more time into this great thing. Um, he asked me, why don't they use the freaking challenge system on clay? 
And I don't want to get into this for too long. I just want to throw something out there that maybe you haven't thought about. It could destroy the credibility of the challenge system. Now, they admit it's a little off by a millimeter or two. Not much. Although sometimes you see those challenges where it's like, oh, it caught less than half a millimeter of the line. Hmm. If the challenge system is even a little off, and this could be a one-time fluke. Let's say the challenge system is 99.9% accurate most of the time. But maybe one day, I don't know how these things work exactly, but maybe they didn't calibrate it right that day. Also, my understanding is that clay, the surface is constantly changing, right? A hard court doesn't change too much. Even grass does, and it was a lot harder to get the challenge system working on grass because as you dig into the court, it literally changes the shape of it, if you think about it. Not by much, but again, this is a game of inches. I really think tennis is a game of millimeters. So if it's a little bit off, the whole thing falls apart, and it only takes a little bit for people to start seeing, oh, uh, it doesn't work. You know, it only has to be a little off, and clay is the place where it could happen, where they could show it on TV, oh, Here's what the challenge says, and here's the mark. You know when they do a close-up with the camera on the mark in the clay? And you could clearly see they're like an inch apart from each other. Next thing you know, players, fans, no one buys into the challenge system anymore, and tennis has to throw the whole thing in the trash. That would be a disaster. That would be a nightmare. So I think that's the biggest reason why we don't see it on clay, because that's the one surface where if for some reason the challenge system doesn't work one day or it's a little bit inaccurate that day more than usual, it could become painfully obvious to El Mundo. So there you go. That's what I think about the challenge system. Plus, if they had a hard time calibrating for grass and they had to keep doing all these different like models, basically, they had to test it out, mess up the grass and see how it changes and calibrate, calibrate, calibrate so it's ready for anything, uh, clay is constantly moving. Then they're watering it. Then they're dragging a big rake over it <laughs> to smooth it out. I mean, clay is like a living, breathing surface that uh, never stops changing. So that has a lot to do with it. There you go. Wanted to get that out of the way. Been meaning to address that for like four videos now, and I kept forgetting. All right, so back to Federer. What did I get wrong and right? Well, one, uh, the forehand's not as good, not as steady, but I think the coach either... <laughs> Either Oscar the Otter listens to Coffee Break Tennis, or the coach does, or they're just smart tennis people and they figured it out. But they said, look, dude, maybe against Malek Jaziri, you can fall back and hit uh, more passive forehands and kind of back up. Not against Federer. So clearly, Oscar the Otter, if you watch the whole match, I'm sure you saw him just freaking crush. Absolute crunch time crunching some uh, some big forehands and sometimes missing, sometimes putting them in. So he tried to step in and be more aggressive on the forehand. That was clearly deliberate to avoid falling into the trap because him and the coach knew you, you can't do this with Roger Federer. You need to step in and, and smack the thing or else you're toast, dude. And clearly he embraced the whole, I might never get this opportunity again to play Federer here in front of all these people. So he went all out in the serve. His average serve speed, like I said, I'm not going to edit anything in because we're trying to just get this done so I can sleep and wake up and do this all again tomorrow. But the average surge speed was up considerably. And I want to say the second serve speed, like I said, my Wi-Fi is down. I can't even look it up if I want. The second serve speed was up like five miles an hour, I think, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it was an, there was an effort there. And he, he seemed to hit second serves better to me than he did against Malek Jaziri, at least. Wasn't the greatest, but... um wasn't as bad as what I thought I saw with the Malek Jaziri match. Another thing is, you know, Federer sometimes is a very stubborn, grumpy old goat. We saw him do it very famously. A great example, I think, is against Del Potro last year, Indian Wells. He kept challenging the Del Potro forehand. It's something about Federer where he thinks, I want to attack your strength and break it down because I'm good enough to do it. And uh, how are you going to feel after I break down your strength? Now... Where I know Federer and the team knew that the backhand was more solid were the pressure moments. First set, Roger breaks serve to take the set, remember? And as soon as he got the 1540, he falls back on the serve return. He backs up to make sure he can get a forehand. 
And what does Federer do? He directs, I believe, three forehands in a row cross court straight to the Oscar Ata forehand. Federer knows on the crucial moments, that's when you see Federer target weaknesses. Now, typically for him, he goes after your backhand. It's a set point. It's a, a break point on his serve, whatever. Crucial moments, Federer will often find the weakness. Second set, Roger serves for the set. And, and what happened, by the way? Forehand unforced error. Federer directs three forehands off the return, returns to the forehand cross court, cracks another forehand cross court, cracks another forehand cross court. This is the first set I'm talking about. And breaks the serve, takes the set 6-4. The second set, Roger serves for the set. I can't remember if this was 6-3 or 6-4, but when Roger serves, remember he is down 15-40 on his own serve. And the serve, he directs traffic on serve to the forehand. Targets the Oscar the Ada forehand. So my point here is I was I was right about it. The, the forehand was the one that was more likely to break down. And Federer, when he wins that set on set point, again, in the rally, it, was, it would be deuce than add. So this is an add court serve. Roger does like to hit his second serve right on the tee at the forehand often, but... Typically, we're going to see him kick it out wide like all right-handed players do on second serve most of the time. Try to kick it high and away to the backhand and create angle. Federer loves to create angle. You know, we also see Federer go after the forehand a lot and deuce because he just hits that slider short in the court with the super swing to the left. He hits that so well that even if it is your forehand and it's your better shot, better shot Roger doesn't care because if he hits that serve well enough, He's got a wide open court. He can go to the net and volley, you know, cross court backhand volley into the open court. Uh, any, you know, he can step around a short ball and hit it inside out forehand. He can just hit a cross court backhand. He can hit behind you. So much stuff can happen when he creates that opening in the court with the big a- angle off the serve. Uh, so anyway, my, my point was he, he kicked it out wide when he had set point on his serve in the second set. But then he hits, I think, again, three forehands or Some of them were backhands. I think some backhands up the line. Anyways, he puts like three balls in a row straight to the Oscar forehand. So I get that right. Here's the thing I didn't get right. Well, technically, one thing I said, by the way, was there's no way Oscar wins more than... I said he'll win about 30% of Federer's serve points. So on return, Oscar will win about 30% of the points. And Oscar actually won, I think, 24 or 25, something like that. So pretty low. So I was right about that. Now, something I was technically right about, like 1% Murray, 1% right, I said there is no way Oscar is going to win 58% on second serve against Federer again. And he didn't. I was right. He won 57. Ha! And here's why. The last thing we'll say, and then we'll get out of here. Roger Federer, he's kind of like Pete Sampras in some ways, you know. He's going to hold serve. And he's going to put the pressure on you by continuing to hold serve easily. And he's going to create enough opportunities to where there's going to be a game where you're going to double fault once. You're going to miss a ball. Federer's going to float back a backhand and get into a rally, or Pete Sampras would, you know. And then he's going to hit one great return. Just, you know, you'll miss your spot and a forehand up the line winner. Federer, you know, he, he does that. The difference is... Sampras is uh, probably a better server, even though you can make a strong case for Federer being the greatest server of all time. And Federer is better at returning and better in the rallies than Pete Sampras. But they're alike in that. And to me, this is a little different here. And the biggest thing to me is Federer, you know, we talk about how many options he has. He might hit a drop shot on the return. He might uh, chip it low and bring you in and then pass you. He might rip he does so much stuff when they talk about young Federer he was indecisive you know didn't know how to play his game kind of like what we see Dimitrov still to this day Dimitrov not always sure what he's trying to do because he's you know such a talented guy he's got so many options I feel like if there's any bit of that left and maybe this is why Federer's had a hard time over the years breaking is on his serve he's so comfortable attacking you with his serve and he has so many things that he likes to do, and he's so comfortable doing all of them that for some reason it just comes more natural all the ways he's going to use his many talents to attack you with his serve as the starting point. But with return, I feel like he can still be a little indecisive at times. And 
if you're just trying so many different things, some days it's all going to go in, and some days you're going to miss a bunch of it, and then next thing you know, you failed to convert 10 breakpoints. So I just wanted to put that out there. To me, Roger just didn't return very well. The second serve wasn't that much better from Oscar. It was better than he did against Malek Jaziri in the first round, but I really feel like Federer, this could have been beat down City, and don't get me wrong, it was a good win for Federer, and he played pretty well for the most part especially on his serve. I mean, he, he played downright amazing at times. But it, the match could have been much more like what we see Nadal doing. Could have been beat down City if Federer would have just done better with some of those second serves, period. He, he missed some returns. He, he didn't look very good. Shouldn't have missed him, Roger. Uh, there you go. That's the show. I can't believe I said, uh, uh, again. Too many uhs. Hit the music. We're getting out of here. Tomorrow we'll be back with a full video. Uh, one last thing I want to say. Some people have commented that they didn't see updates on the exclusive content for the Patreon people. Well, I didn't intend to do any of that until I got to a certain number. If you uh, saw, I wrote it on the Patreon page. But I thought about that, and I said, you know what? Screw that. So I don't know when, but before the end of the French Open, pretty soon, we're going to do some special uh, bonus videos or podcasts just for the Patreon people. Exclusivo. Only them. Because uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, stop saying, uh, that's my problem with podcasts. I feel so much more free. I don't have to worry about, do I look stupid when I'm saying this? How's my, how's my hair? I can just let it all, as the Bryan brothers say. Let it rip, let it soar, make your dreams come true and more. See ya!